Do any of you feel condemned? You know what the Bible says causes that? Most of us would think, well, it's my sin. No, nope. the Bible says it's the law ministers condemnation. If you want to get free from condemnation, you got to get free from the law. Stay tuned for the gospel truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing to teach on the true nature of God. And I've been on this now for, I think this is our eighth day that we've been covering this teaching. Actually, this is just a continuation of a lot of things I've been teaching about how God loves us unconditionally, how His love isn't based on anything we do. God loves us because He is love and not because we are lovely. And when you say things like that, a lot of people, especially those that have been raised in church and around Christianity, have a number of issues with that because they say, but what about this? God hates the sinner. God hates the ungodly. That who shall stand in the hill of the Lord? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. You can't tell me that our performance doesn't affect God. When people say things like that, they always go back to the Old Covenant. And the key, I believe, to understanding the unconditional love of God is to understand that the Old Covenant and the New Covenants are different. So, like I said, I've been teaching on this for eight days. We've already covered a lot of material. And on our program yesterday, I began to start using Scripture that showed that the law was given for a totally different purpose than what most Christians have ever thought. For instance, on Monday's broadcast, I talked about how that the law is good if you use it lawfully. In other words, there's a right and a wrong use of the law, and the wrong use is when you try and use it on a Christian. The Bible says, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, etc. The law isn't made for a Christian. The law was given to drive us to the Lord for salvation, but then once we're saved, it's wrong to tell a Christian that you have to do this and this and this in order to have God love you or accept you or answer your prayers or fellowship with you or use you. That's wrong, and yet that's exactly what's being said. And then I used on our program yesterday, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56, the latter part of that verse says, "...the strength of sin is the law." And I showed how that the law strengthened our enemy sin. It didn't strengthen us in our battle against sin, but it strengthened sin and helped sin to defeat us. Well, that's a radical thought. And again, I say, I said this on our program yesterday, if I hadn't have shown you this from Scripture, if I was just out on the street and if I said, Did you believe, do you believe that the law strengthened sin in your life? I can guarantee you 99 out of 100 Christians would say, absolutely not. The law is what's helping me to overcome sin. But the Bible says just the opposite. See, the law empowers sin in your life. I know some of you, your brain's just going tilt and saying, no, 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 this can't be, but I'm, I'm sharing with you from Scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 56, that's what it says. Now, is the Bible true or not? Are you going to hold your tradition and just what you assume all of your life? Is that going to hold dominance over you? Or are you going to let the Word get in the way of your theology? The Bible says in Romans 3, 4, Let God be true and every man a liar. You need to get to the place to where God's Word dominates you and not what somebody else says, not what your grandma said or dear Aunt Susie or... You know, because this denomination is taught a certain way their whole life, that's what you're going to believe. The Word of God ought to be absolute and final authority in your life. And the Bible says that the law strengthened sin. The reason for that is sin had already beat you, but some of us didn't know it because we compared ourselves among other people and we thought, I'm not as bad as they are, so I'm, I'm really a good sinner. I know I'm not perfect, but I'm a, I'm a sinner, but I'm a good sinner. And you thought that you were okay with sin. So what the law did, it amplified sin. It made lust come alive on the inside of you. I'm going to show you other scriptures that talk about that out of Romans chapter 7. It says the law came alive and it made us have concupiscence, which is talking about extreme or uncontrolled lust. 
The law accomplished those things. Here's some other scriptures about what the law did. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and in verse 6 it says, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, talking about the Old Testament, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, the Old Testament law kills, but the Spirit giveth life. Man, that's a strong statement right there. The Old Testament law killed. And somebody says, well, I'm not sure it's talking about that. Well, look at the next verse. It says, but if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones. What's that talking about? Well, when it talks about written and engraven in stones, this is talking about specifically the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses up on the Mount Sinai and he actually wrote on it with his own finger. And it was written in the finger of God is what it says over there in the book of Exodus. And it says... It calls that the ministration of death written and engraven in stones. The Old Testament law, specifically the Ten Commandments, weren't given to give you life and to give you freedom and liberty and victory. They were given to kill you, to ensnare you. I just know in my heart some of you are saying, this can't be, and you are just struggling with this. But tell me what I'm reading wrong. You can go to any translation you want to. I'm reading out of the King James. But you can go to any translation. It's going to say the same thing. It says in verse 7, But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? If you read this any way you want to read it, you can go into the Greek and dissect it backwards and forwards. It's just saying that the law of Moses was death. It was given to kill. In the New Testament, Jesus said this in many different ways, but in John chapter 10, verse 10, he said, The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. The New Testament is saying that Jesus is the life giver. The devil is the one who has death. It also says over in Hebrews chapter 2 that uh, the devil is the one who had the power of death. Jesus came to destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. And so Satan is the author of death. And the law is a minister of death, an agent of death in our life. Now, I know some of you are struggling with this because, again, this isn't the concept we've had. Most people have been taught that God gave us the law to help us. Well, it is a help in the sense that as the law knocks us flat of our face and makes us guilty before God and just makes us totally condemned and makes sin come alive on the inside of us, it helps in the sense that it shows you that you can never purge yourself of your own sin. It takes away any misconceptions about becoming self-righteous and it makes you throw yourself upon God for mercy. So in that sense, it is helpful if you use the law for that purpose to show people their need for God. But it is not good if you try and use the law to get people who already recognize their need for God. They've already confessed Jesus as their Lord. They're born again and now they have right standing with God. They are supposed to recognize their right position with God and the goodness of God leads a believer to repentance. The law showing us our not our goodness but rather our evilness, our sinfulness, the law drives people to this conclusion that they need God. But then once they come to God, they shouldn't be driven to that conclusion anymore. They should instead be shown what they have in Christ and we should be serving God under a new covenant. This is completely different than what most people have heard and that's the reason that we aren't getting the right results. So it goes on to say, I'm reading in the same place, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and verse 9, it goes on to say, For if the ministration of condemnation be glory. And again, if you go back to verse 7 and read this in its context, the ministration of condemnation is talking about the law written and engraven in stone, specifically the Ten Commandments, but not limited to the Ten Commandments. All of the commandments that were commanded, what we had to do to be right with God, it's, it calls that a ministration of condemnation. 
So, the law here is called condemnation. It says in Romans chapter 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. There is no condemnation from God towards us. Condemnation is gone. And yet, a person who is living under the law, under a mentality that they've got to do certain things to please God and earn His acceptance and earn His intervention in their life, People with that kind of mindset are under condemnation because the law, this mentality that I've got to do something to please God is always going to point out your failures and show you where you missed it. Did you know that the law doesn't ever compliment you? The law will never make you feel good. The law will only show you your need. It doesn't matter if there was a thousand things that you were commanded to do and if you did 999 right, the law won't give you a single compliment. It won't pat you on the back and make you feel good. It'll point out the one thing you did wrong and show you you missed it. You failed. You're a loser. It's not going to work. That's the ministry of the law. It's to condemn. That's what this is saying. And you know what? It's working. Many of you are condemned to the max. Many of you, it doesn't matter how hard you try, and if you would be honest, you've improved a lot. You're doing better than you've ever done, and yet many of you don't ever focus on how far you've come. You only focus on how far you've got to go. You're just constantly, always condemned. Now, the word condemn loses its meaning to some people, but it just simply means that you feel unfit for use. You feel... Like, God, I haven't done enough. And most of us are condemned because of the law. We need to change that. So I use the scripture out of 1 Timothy chapter 1 that says that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law isn't made for a righteous man. There is a right use of the law, and the right use is to show a non-believer his need for God. But once you become a believer, it's wrong to minister the law to a Christian. We should not be relating to God based on our performance. And so we've used that verse, then we use 1 Corinthians 15, 56, that the strength of sin is the law. The law didn't strengthen you, it strengthened your enemy, sin. Then we use 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, that calls the law, called the law administration of death. And then verse 9 calls it administration of condemnation. So think about what the Bible is saying here about the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law, 1 Corinthians 15, 56, strengthened sin. The Old Testament law, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, was a ministration of death. 2 Corinthians 3, 9, it was a ministration of condemnation. It, it strengthened sin. It killed you. It condemned you. And yet we fight so hard to say, oh no, I believe we're supposed to be living by this law. God gave us the law to do something wonderful in our life. Well, it was good in the sense that it showed us we needed God and drove us to our knees. But other than that, the ministry of the law is to strengthen sin, to kill you, to condemn you, and as I go on through these scriptures, to make sin come alive, to make lust abound, to magnify the offense, to just basically destroy any self-righteous ambition that you ever had. That's what the law was given for. And if it was used for that purpose, it would be great. But the problem has been that the church has been using the law to, as if it was a good thing to tell people who've already been born again how displeased God is, how God demands this and this and this, and if you aren't getting your prayers answered, it's because you have done this wrong and that wrong, and that is a wrong use of the law, and it's killing, it's condemning, and it's destroying people. The Old Testament law is not for the New Testament believer. You know, there is a right use of the law. I've already used that scripture out of 1 Timothy chapter 1. Let me give you an example that some of the great revivalists that I've read about, um, you know, John Wesley, Charles Finney, uh, George Whitfield, all of these guys, specifically, um, let's see, who is it? Finney, Charles Finney. He used to go in and hold meetings, and he wouldn't just minister for two or three days 
the way that I typically do today, but he would go into an area and he would stay there for a month or two months or three months. And he would just stay as long as he felt like he was making an impact and the impact of his ministry would just grow and snowball. And here's the way that he would minister. He would go in for nearly the first month, at least two, three weeks or something like that. He would go in and preach the law and talk about the anger and the wrath and the punishment of God. And he would take away people's, you know, uh, complacency. The truth is, most people, because they can't see hell, and they aren't seeing it with their physical eyes, they put this out of their mind. They forget that there is coming a day where we are going to stand before God and be judged. And they look around and they just compare themselves among themselves and they get to thinking, I'm all right, you're all right, you know, it's going to work out. And we have lit literally lulled ourselves into a position of deception. And many people just think, well, you know, I, I've actually heard people go out on the street and say, you know, are you a good person? And most people, oh yeah, I'm a pretty good, relatively good person. Well, are you going to go to heaven? Yeah, I believe I'm going to go to heaven. And you ask them why? Well, because I'm a good person. And see, that's deception. Nobody goes to heaven because they're good, because they earn it. We're all sinners. Every one of us deserves hell. But there are people who don't have that recognition, and so they deceive themselves. And so, you know what Charles Finney would do? He would go in and for the first month just beat people to a pulp with the law and show them the anger of God, the holiness of God, the unholiness of man. And he would get people to a place to where they recognized that if God didn't have mercy on them, they were damned to hell. And then, after he got people recognizing their need for God, then he would go to preaching the grace of God and tell them how that God loves you in spite of the fact that you've sinned and that you've defiled yourself. God loves you and God wants to move in your life. And I mean, people would start getting born again. Lives would start being changed and they would see great revival. But see, I consider that a proper use of the law. Now, I'm not sure that I would do it exactly that same way, but I understand the logic. I understand that what he's doing is, first of all, taking away all hope of any self-righteousness through the law. That's what the purpose of the law was, is to condemn you and to make you guilty, to minister death, to minister condemnation, to strengthen sin in your life. Once you come to that place that you realize that sin has beaten you and that you can't win on your own, you cannot overcome it, then you're in a position to say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. But see, you need to be brought to that place of recognizing that you need God. And that's what the law was given to do. And that's the majority of the Old Testament was given for that purpose. is to show you the holiness of God, the unholiness of man, to show you in God's dealing with mankind how he wouldn't tolerate sin, how he punished it, how he did this. And the logic behind it was to make you despair. You see people's stories in here who were much better than what we are and yet they were rejected by God. And also you see people's stories in the Bible who were much worse than we are and they were accepted by God. And the message is there if you will see it. That God loves us in spite of who we are and not because of who we are. And the law is to amplify who we are not so that we would not try and approach unto God based on our own goodness, but instead throw ourselves on God for mercy. That's the purpose of the law. And that's what all of these scriptures I'm pointing out say. This isn't what religion is saying. Most people are thinking that the law is wonderful to help you overcome sin, to show you step 1 through 10,000, all of the things that you must do to get right with God. No, it's showing you step one through 10,000 all of the things that you have to do to be right with God so that you will recognize that the list is more than what any of you can ever accomplish and you would just say, God, if that's it, have mercy on me, a sinner. You know, this friend of mine, Dave Duell, tells a little story, a joke about this, about a guy who died and went to heaven and when he got to the pearly gates, an angel says... Uh, you know, what's your name? And he gave him his name and he said, all right, what makes you worthy to come in here? And he says, well, I, I'm a really good person. And the angel says, well, all right, you've got to have 100 points to get into heaven. 
And the guy thought, well, man, that ought to be easy. I'm a very good person. So he says, man, I went to church every time the doors were open. I have attendance awards. I was really diligent in going to church. And so the angel says, all right, that's worth half a point. And the guy says, half a point? He says, well, I paid my tithes every time. I mean, I was faithful paying my tithes. And he says, all right, that's worth one point. That gives you a total of 1.5. And he says, well, I, I was faithful to my wife. I never did commit adultery. I never cheated on her. I never even desired anybody else. I was totally faithful. He says, well, that's worth two points. Congratulations. You got three and a half points. And the guy, I mean, by the time he got up to about five points, he had listed every good thing he had ever done, and he had 95 points to go. And this man finally says, man, if that's what it demands, if I've got to have 100 points, I'll never make it. I just have to throw myself on the mercy of God. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the angel goes, bingo, amen, come on in. And see, that's what the purpose of the law was to do, is to show you such a high standard that you could never save yourself. And you'd just say, if this is what God is demanding, Lord, have mercy on me. And that's what the purpose of the law was. It's one of the biggest deceptions Satan has ever put across to convince people that the law and all of these commandments were given to help you overcome sin. The law was given to help sin overcome you. I know those are radical statements, but I'm quoting Scripture to you. I don't know how anybody who believes in the Bible could take issue with this. But the problem is most people don't let the Bible get in the way of their theology. The Bible has very little influence on most people's theology. If that's the way it is with you, then you know what you need to change. Look at some other passages over here. Romans chapter 3. And in verse, uh, well, the whole chapter of Romans chapter 3 is showing the universality of sin. That all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But specifically, look in Romans chapter 3 and in verse 19. It says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Here again are some of the points or the purpose of the Old Testament law. It was given to stop your mouth, to take away your excuses, all of your rationale for why you were justified in being this way. You know, today, nobody's responsible for anything. The reason you're a triple murderer and rapist is because you didn't get a birthday cake when you were three years old. It's your parents' fault. You know what? When you stand before God, the law is going to stop your mouth and you aren't going to have any excuses, and it says it makes you guilty before God. That's the purpose of the law, is to make you guilty, to stop your mouth. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 and 9 says that it kills you. It's a ministration of condemnation. 1 Corinthians 15, 56, it strengthens sin. Man, there's five negative effects of the law totally different than what most people understand, but it's absolutely true according to Scripture.